So let's say um, with my <clears throat> testosterone of 381, I, I take HCG uh -huh. and my testosterone goes to 1200, 1000, uh -huh. 1200. Like it goes to upper end of the range. So we've learned that, hey, my hypogonadism is central. It's not peripheral, right? Uh -huh. Somehow my pituitary isn't making enough signal because clearly my testes can make enough testosterone. Uh -huh. With armed with that information, what what is the best course of action? Is it to stay the course and just say, well, hey, keep taking HCG because at least your testes are responding to it, or you know, is there some obvious problem solving? And, and I'm thinking about this even in my case, right? Because you know, like when I think of all the things that would normally impair pituitary function, the first thing that comes to my mind is sleep disruption. Yeah, and you know, knock on wood, that's one thing I've pretty much got down in the toolkit. My sleep is, is great. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe stress, pr you know, probably hypercortisolemia, maybe not so great. Um, training, overtraining, undertraining, like, you, you know, what, are, what are the, what are the things you would look at to, to brainstorm if that scenario were the case? I don't know if that's the case, by the way, but that's an experiment that is probably worth doing to see, Hey, where, why is my T low? Is it low because my brain isn't saying the right thing or is it low because my body can't do it? Yeah, I think there is multi, multiple factors here that could be fleshed out before you ended up on an HCG to even figure out, you know, what's my response at the testes level. Figuring out if you can top out the natural signal, I feel, is the first thing to do pending your blood work looks like, you know, gonadotropins are low to mid-range and I'm still not, you know, wh why am I only getting a 381 response out of that? It would be to look to many of the things you just said, which obviously you're pretty dialed on. And then above and beyond that, it would be assessing the basics like micronutrient intake, macros. Are you eating enough to recover relative to your training stimulus? Um, I'm not going to say a lot of people overtrain too much. Maybe they're just under recovering and their sleep is bad. That's probably a more realistic outcome. But in general, there is not in your case, but in many other individuals, micronutrient deficiencies across the board, zinc intakes not being adequate amounts, magnesium intake super low, and that's impactful as well. Um, an array of things, vitamin D being low, also very impactful. And these things can all move the needle like 100 plus nanograms per deciliter, potentially, depending how deficient you are. So some of these low hanging fruits with the sleep, micronutrients, minerals, actual macro intake, some people are eating ultra garbage processed foods, no micronutrient density, they're under eating, maybe they're on semaglutide and they're, you know, super calorie deprived and they have very low protein or something. That's also impactful. All of these assessments, do I have an adequate energy intake and of that energy intake, high quality nutrient value in that energy relative to my demands and my training hard enough to actually maximize testosterone too, because that's also a factor is your resistance training regimen and the sleep, all of these things in concordance will ultimately dictate what is your output. And then let's just say you've had that all dialed in at that point, if it's still either suboptimal signaling, so, you know, low, low normal, whatever it is, or even normal gonadotropin output, and then you're still getting an inadequate response, you could then potentially discern partly that you're not going to be able to get the signal you need out of your pituitary to optimize, or you actually have some degradation of response at the receptor level in the testes themselves, which is an age deteriorated thing as well. Unfortunately, like I would love to just say everyone's testes are going to retain perfect function forever. But it's not the case. So similar to the signal, there's also the health of the actual organ. So if those things are all optimized, like you've kind of done your due diligence, it's just making sure you actually know what the due diligence is and you didn't and just- if those things are optimized and you're at 381 and you take HCG and your T goes up, yeah. what, it, what, it, what, what, what does that imply? That there's some other factor that we're unaware of that's impairing yeah, I would, central Yeah, stimulus. I would be like, what's your GNRH output then? Not that I know how you can yeah, even yeah. measure that, but presumably that may be low or the receptor response to the GNRH is suboptimal too. Yeah, interesting. So it's like a whole upstream. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> that's, the, that's the problem with these. Is there anything that... You could use a GNRH agonist and even test out what your pituitary output is from there, but that's like good luck finding a doctor who understands the yeah. nuance of not castrating you with that yeah although what you could do is then you could use clomid 
Sure. Right. So then you could say, okay, if the response to HCG is favorable, then you know directly stimulating the late egg cell produces testosterone. Assuming you had enough testosterone to aromatize to estradiol, that was a meaningful impact from inhibiting its negative feedback to begin with. So it's like, well, at, at least with a GnRH agonist, I know I'm maximally stimulating pituitary output to right. whatever capacity it is. Yeah. With Clomid, I'm just inhibiting negative feedback to whatever suboptimal capacity my ER is agonized. Yep. Although you'd want to think if you gave a high enough dose, yeah, you're right. In my case, maybe that wouldn't work because my estradiol is so low to begin with. You're not maybe. inhibiting that much. That's a very interesting point. So you're... um. If estradiol is really low, Clomid could fail just on the basis of that. Like if you really wanted to test pituit pituitary output potential, you would use a uh, GnRH agonist and see what happens. And if you could push... Is there, is there one out there? There's a gonadarellin is often used and I think misrepresented as a HRT therapy, but it does, it is a GnRH agonist. There's other ones that are used for other indications, mm. but like, yeah, they exist. But you know, again, it, it's interesting in that the question is that what's the so what, right? Like, so yeah. this is a super interesting line of inquiry. Um, and let's say you learned, oh, you respond favorably to HCG. You do not respond to the GnRH. Mm. Oh. Well, then the problem is something is wrong with the pituitary. The pituitary is missing the signal. Yeah, but maybe I've seen people diagnose adenomas by actually digging into that stuff. So I think it's mm. worthwhile to understand because maybe you have, again, it depends how long you've been monitoring your hormones. Like, have you always been a healthy person? Or is well, this, this is like where a, maybe the endocrinologist can really do the heavy lifting here, right? For like sure. if, you, if you go and see a physician who day and night is, you know, thinking through all of the intricate pathways here. Yeah, that, that you know, maybe there is a microadenoma. I mean, one of the things we like to do in people when we can't solve this problem before we send them to an endocrinologist is, you know, measure prolactin, ACTH, a few of the other pituitary hormones yeah, to kind of get a sense yeah. if yeah. anything else is out of whack. Yeah, sometimes you'll have like a prolactin secreting adenoma too, and it's problematic yeah. as well. There's a lot of weird stuff that it's tough because it's, I would love to say, you should understand this before you take hormones for the rest of your life, but it's hard to expect everyone to understand this axis to the degree where even we're going back and forth. Like, what about this? So it's like, how would I ever expect, you know, like you, you just have to find as good of a uh, medical provider as possible, I suppose. That's... Yeah, I mean, I, I do hope that people take from this discussion the following, right? Which is um, HRT is serious business. And um, I, I think... I do think a lot of people are doing it incorrectly. Um, and I think there are a lot of really irresponsible people out there who are, uh, you know, frankly, just practicing dangerous medicine, if not veterinary medicine outright. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, again, I don't see a lot of this in my practice. There are there usually people aren't coming to see me who have been, you know, terribly decimated by someone doing awful HRT in them. But you, you know, you, you sort of, I, I, I can see people on YouTube where I'm shaking my head going, oh my God, what's that guy talking about? What's yeah. that guy doing? Um, so, you know, there, there is clearly a use case to understand this stuff before you go down the rabbit hole. And hopefully this, this type of content helps. Um, anything else you want to say on TRT before we kind of pivot to something else? Um, yeah, I guess just to, you know, put a bow tie on the whole natural stimulation thing. Um, I do think if you are mindful of fertility, it's worth consideration of HCG concurrently with your whatever you're going to be using. Like if you're on TRT and you're going to shut yourself down, don't make the mistake that thousands of bodybuilders have where they got on hormones, ended up with atrophy testicles, and then when they were 10 years later, wanted to have a child, realized the arduous recovery process was like pretty significant. Are there guys that can recover after 10 years of TRT? So I dug into that because you asked me about a five-year last time I was okay, here. Sure, five the year. longest I could find was four, and it seemed to be pretty reliably restored, but there are some that just doesn't seemingly. In in general, And these guys, to go to, if you're on, so you're saying someone is on uninterrupted testosterone replacement therapy for four years. These were abusers. 
Okay, so of, they're on very high doses. But it's not like a controlled trial, too, where it's like, you're going to take super physiologic trend. It was like, you guys abused some amounts of synthetic yeah. drugs and have been shut down. And to, to rescue these guys, they were using recombinant FSH and HCG in mega doses? No, they were just doing whatever PCT they deemed worthwhile in general. Some of them no PCT. So it's it was it wasn't a trial where they all got a oh I fixed, see it wasn't a standardized no, recovery yeah but what I've seen at least from these um, studies which you know admittedly it's not like I'm behind them or anything so it doesn't really matter but it's they're not the most high quality controlled things but it's very difficult to control for illegally used drugs at abusive dosages in random bodybuilding population so what we see though in general is once the hormones have left your system and there's no more residual negative feedback there is a recovery period that could be as short as you know weeks to months but in general most people will recover within one to two years even if abusing yeah but it's not 100 <laughs> percent 